Hello. For those of you who don't know me, yes, I'm Julia, and yes, I am a politician. I was elected earlier this year uh, for the German Pirate Party to the European Parliament, and it's really a great honor to be able to speak here, uh, especially because I know that my profession does not always have the greatest uh, reputation among hackers. Uh, I think there is good reason for that. Uh, our democratic institutions all across the world are facing a legitimacy crisis, and I have great respect for everybody who chooses to try to bring about societal change through direct uh, through direct action, through hacking. But I'm hoping that with my talk I can show you that, at least in some areas like copyright, there really is good reason and there is hope uh, to try to engage in the more traditional political institutions like parliaments and really get involved in the political process uh, to try and change things for the better. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about file sharing and about the reasons uh, that the Pirate Party came about and what's wrong with uh, copyright in general. I think a lot of you have heard quite a lot about this. Uh, what I really want to focus on in this talk is what in particular is wrong with the EU copyright system that we have today. Um, because, you see, there are two legal traditions underlying the European copyright. Uh, on the one hand, we have uh, the Anglo-American tradition of copyright, which uh, includes a fair use clause, which means that um, the exceptions from copyright are interpreted by uh, judges who are weighing the protection of rights holders against the interests of the public in court rulings. Uh, there's the other legal tradition underlying the EU copyright system, which is uh, the continental European tradition of uh, droit d'auteur or uh, author's rights. In this system, the authors uh, of cultural works have certain inalienable rights that they cannot sell to a right holder. And uh, importantly, the exceptions to copyright, uh, the interests of the public are written into the law. And, um, both of these systems have some problems and some critics, so critics of the American fair use system argue um, that it is kind of intransparent because uh, when you are using a cultural work, sometimes you cannot be exactly sure whether what you are doing uh, is actually lawful or not. And uh, some people say that it's biased in favor of people who can afford to go to the courts uh, if there really is a disagreement about uh, the interpretation of fair use. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the problem with the continental system is that it is quite inflexible because um, every time a new use, a new technological development comes about, you actually have to go and change the law if you want to allow this uh, type of use without uh, a copyright infringement. So everything new, that uh, every new way of dealing with culture is forbidden by default and you actually have to change the law uh, to, to make it uh, um, legal. So. What the European Union has done in its copyright directive of 2001 is really cre uh, create the worst of both worlds to take the bad parts of both of these systems. Um, in the European Union, we have a system that is uh, inflexible because we don't have a fair use exception that would allow us to adapt quickly to new technological developments and new types of using culture. Um, but it is also intransparent because uh, the European Union has managed to only harmonize the interests of the right holders and to create minimum standards for the protection of copyright in every European country. But they have failed uh, to harmonize uh, the rights of the public and they have not created minimum standards of users' rights. Uh, instead, what you have in the European Copyright Directive is a list of 20 optional exceptions to copyright. So, uh, for example, for educational use or for citation, for parody, every single member state gets to decide themselves whether they actually want to implement this copyright exception into their national law or not. So if you can calculate, like uh, Smaury McCarthy has done in a paper, uh, there are actually over two million different ways of combining these 20 optional exceptions. And therefore, it's extremely unlikely to find two European countries that actually have exactly the same copyright rules. And now if you're dealing with um, uh, cultural content on the internet and trying to communicate across borders or even offer a service in more than one country, it's, you really have to be a copyright lawyer to understand what is actually legal and what is not. 
Um, all of this sounds a little bit abstract, so I want to give you just uh, five examples of how uh, this system is really uh, to the detriment of regular people who are dealing with culture on the internet. Um, the first is uh, the case of uh, an exception to copyright called freedom of panorama that has not been uh, implemented in the majority of European states. Uh, freedom of panorama simply means that if you're standing in a public place and taking a picture of a building, you can do anything with this picture, regardless of the copyright of the architect who actually built this place. Uh, a lot of European countries, actually the majority, don't have this copyright exception, which means that if you travel to France, you take a picture of the European Parliament building in Strasbourg and want to put it on the internet, you actually need permission for that. Um, so this is clearly uh, kind of counterintuitive because the parliament should be a public building that is, uh, everybody is able to see and to take pictures of. And so uh, Wikipedia actually approached the parliament administration and said, hey, we want to show the people what the parliament looks like. Can we use a picture? And uh, the parliament administration said, uh, sure. The problem is uh, it turned out that the European parliament administration actually didn't have the rights to allow this. So, so when they found this out, uh, what Wikipedia did was this. Uh, this is uh, one of the pictures used uh, in the article about the parliament. And what you can see here are the flags in front of the parliament. And uh, the parliament building just happens to be in the background. But it's not the object of this picture, so therefore uh, it does not violate the copyright of the architect. <laughs> Um, whether this interpretation would all actually hold up in court uh, is kind of open to question, but uh, the thing is it's extremely unlikely that every, anybody is ever actually going to take this to court. And uh, this is an example that really shows kind of the core problem that we have with copyright in the EU, that uh, the system is so complicated and so archaic that uh, Everybody from people to companies to public institutions like the European Parliament itself, everybody is violating copyright on a regular basis, often without even knowing it. And the only reason that the system hasn't collapsed is that the vast majority of creators actually don't enforce their rights. So um, this is just one example of such a copyright exception that is often not implemented. And you would think that you have a better situation with a copyright exception that exists more or less everywhere, like the exception for parody. Uh, most countries have some sort of copyright exception to parody because it's really important for free speech to be able to show, for example, a public figure and make fun of them. Um, this is a picture that I used uh, when the new digital commissioner, Günther Ettinger, uh, was speaking in front of the parliament. And uh, this was a hearing that was live streamed and I was using this on social media to draw attention to it and uh, to get people to suggest good questions to him. So uh, in this picture I'm making a reference of course uh, uh, to the slogan winters coming from Game of Thrones and uh, depending in which European country you are there are different definitions of what a parody actually is. So in some member states they argue that uh, a parody is only exempt from copyright if the copyright holder is actually the person that you are making fun of. So here I am parodying Günther Oettinger, but I'm using material from the HBO show Game of Thrones, and therefore it would not be covered by the copyright uh, exception for parody in some countries, but in others it is. So if I share this on my Twitter account and people from different European countries are uh, sharing it, which would be my ideal scenario for a European public, some of them would be violating copyright laws, others of them wouldn't. Sorry to everybody who retweeted this. Another area uh, where the European system is particularly vested against the interests of the public is the copyright terms. Uh, as you can see on this map, uh, this is not a problem exclusive to the EU at all. Uh, pretty much all over the world we have relatively long copyright terms. In the EU it was lengthened to 70 years after death uh, back in the 90s, before it was 50 years after death. Um, 
But once again, the European Union has only set a minimum standard, but not a maximum. So the rights of the right holders are protected. The rights of the public to have access to information are not. So one country like uh, Spain can simply choose to have an even higher uh, copyright term length. Um, this problem is particularly uh, difficult because we're trying to get kind of a, a European common cultural uh, heritage and have institutions that are actively working on this. Uh, so take, for example, Europeana, which is an online archive of uh, digitalized uh, cultural heritage from the European Union. And when you look at uh, the material that they have digitized and put in their archive, you see something that is referred to as the 20th century black hole, uh, which means that there are significantly less uh, works from the mid to late uh, 20th century than before and after it. Uh, this is because uh, with pretty old works, you can be relatively sure that they are in the public domain and then you can digitize them. And with the new works, you usually know who made them and it's relatively easy to contact the rights holders and to come to some sort of agreement with them. But in the space between, there is a huge number of works that are no longer commercially exploited. There is no way of reaching the rights holder and actually paying them for using this work. Uh, but it's still covered by copyright, so a public institution cannot simply uh, use these works. And um, this problem is once again exacerbated by the complicated system that we have in the EU, because every single member state still insists on having their own copyright terms and uh, having own specific rules for that. Uh, so what you see here is about one-fourth of the decision tree that you have to go to um, to determine whether a European work is in the public domain or not. Um, this is clearly not something that an average person can, can navigate through. And uh, it's not enough in a lot of cases to know who the right holder is and to know when they died. Uh, in some countries like Romania, you have to know how old the children of the author were at the time of his or her death. Um, <laughs> You also have to know uh, whether the author died in the First or Second World War for the country of France uh, to be able to, to find out how long the copyright term is. So, uh, another example um, where the European Union is not protecting the rights of the public. Uh, in 2009, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU came into force and one of those fundamental rights is access to information. Uh, however, the European Union has so far made no uh, attempts to actually enforce this against their member states. So, for example, there is no requirement to actually put official works that are created by the state into the public domain. Uh, this is different in the US. Uh, the picture you can see here uh, is called Earthrise and is from a NASA mission. And uh, because NASA is a public agency in the United States, this kind of work automatically enters the public domain. There's no copyright on it. Uh, everybody can use it. And I think that's probably also one of the reasons why this picture has become such an uh, iconic picture of our common cultural history. Um, in my home country of Germany, uh, there has been some analysis of uh, whether the country actually benefits commercially from having this copyright. Uh, and it turns out that it doesn't. Actually, the bureaucracy of licensing such public works uh, is as big as kind of the revenue that they get from it. And in a lot of uh, cases, it's simply one public agency licensing pictures or other works to another agency. And uh, it just creates kind of a, a bureaucratic overhead and you're shuffling public money from one pocket to another. Uh, so if there is no... Um, financial benefit of uh, having this uh, copyright on public works. There may be other reasons. And uh, one of the speakers here, uh, Stefan Wehrmeier, recently put a freedom of information request to the German government uh, requesting access to an internal document uh, where 
the uh, government was asking the lawyers of the ministry to determine whether a certain proposal for a law would be constitutional or, or not. And uh, because the lawyer said it's probably unconstitutional, actually having this public is quite embarrassing for the government. So when he made this freedom of information request, they were required by law to give him this information. But they also said that he cannot put it online for everybody to see because that would violate the copyright of the lawyers who wrote it. Um, I don't think this is a case of securing an artist's livelihood or anything like this. I think the lawyers are very well compensated for the work by the state in the first place. So clearly this is a, um, an example of the state trying to exercise control over uh, uncomfortable information and using copyright as a censorship tool. Uh, I think in the end, uh, Stefan won uh, in court and the court decided that he had every right to publish this uh, document online. Uh, but still, if we didn't have copyright on official works, we wouldn't have this problem in the first place. Just one last example, uh, blatant copyright infringement on this uh, slide. Um, even though the Copyright Directive of 2001 claims to be uh, bringing copyright to the digital age, harmonizing everything uh, to make it possible to exchange culture online, uh, it actually has nothing dealing with kind of modern forms of uh, using creative content on the internet. So if you use a reaction GIF from, uh, a public, uh, from a popular movie or something like that, you're committing a copyright infringement, even though it's really hard to believe that uh, there is any economic damage to the actual authors, because nobody decides to no longer go to the movie because they saw a reaction GIF and now they feel like they know the gist of the movie. And on the contrary, actually, uh, the sports industry in particular uh, has made it a business model to build trackers and look for uh, gifts from, from football games and then to systematically find their fans. So uh, the reason that uh, we haven't seen a change in this area is probably more that it's beneficial to the rights holders to be able to criminalize people than that it's actually kind of that there is a good reason to give creators this right. Um, so, overall, the European situation for copyright looks relatively bleak. Um, but when I uh, ran for the European Parliament, changing this 2001 copyright directive was actually one of my biggest goals. And I feel like I have actually been elected at exactly the right time to do something about that. And uh, the reason for that is actually uh, mostly thanks to you. Um, back in 2012, uh, people in the European institution really started noticing that something must be wrong with the copyright system if all of a sudden tens of thousands of people are taking th uh, to the streets against the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, ACTA. And, um <laughs> Yeah, it was really the combination of uh, like-minded people working inside the parliament uh, to defeat ACTA and the protests on the street that made sure that in the end the European Parliament voted against ACTA and made sure that it never came into force. So uh, some people in the European institutions have really started realizing that uh, now that we have managed to kind of make things stop getting worse for a while, that uh, we may actually have a chance to change things for the better. So uh, one of the old commissioners from the commission that was uh, in office until uh, November of this year, uh, Nili Cruz, said uh, in a speech that... Um, the current copyright system, as I was explaining, is uh, so fragmented and inflexible that uh, it has become completely irrelevant to people's lives. Nobody is able to follow it, nobody cares whether they follow it. And of course, this uh, quote was immediately turned around by copyright lobbyists who said that Neely Cruz had said that uh, the cultural work of creators was irrelevant and were attacking her for this. Um, she wasn't actually directly in charge of the area of copyright, but uh, even the people in the commission who were working on this issue were starting um, 
to to move a bit. Uh, so last year, around this time, the European Commission was doing a public consultation on copyright, asking everybody who is affected by copyright to give them their opinions about what is wrong with the current rules. So uh, the way this worked is they uh, put online a, work, a Word document with 80 questions, and you could download it, uh, fill in the answers to the question, and send it back to them by email. Um, by the way, questions only available in English. Um, so the EU expected that this is kind of a very academic exercise. Maybe they would get a few hundred responses, mostly from professional uh, organizations. Here is uh, what they got instead. Um, this is uh, the number of participants in several uh, public consultations, and you can see that there is a huge... Uh, uh, relationship between whether or not such a uh, consultation can be filled up, up in online and is aimed at the general public or whether it's just such a document. Uh, so out of all the public consultations ever done that were just kind of a document put on the website, the copyright consultation by far was the one that received the most responses. And uh, it, all in all, it was over 9,000. And uh, <laughs> incidentally... Uh, <laughs> And uh, about half of them actually came from uh, end users uh, of the internet. Um, one of the reasons... Uh, one of the reasons this came about is because uh, developers started building free software that you could use to make it easier to reply to this consultation. And uh, it was actually at a workshop at the 30C3 where the project copywrongs.eu was started, which was using such a free software architecture to build an online form that would really guide you through the questions, like if you want uh, YouTube videos to stop being blocked, go to question number 20 or whatever, and uh, really explain kind of the, the technical terms behind it and make it really easy for average people to reply to this consultation. Uh, this exercise was actually so successful that the free software that was built uh, and, and released uh, on GitHub was actually used by collecting societies to then mobilize their members to also reply to the consultation. So I think this is a very great example of kind of collaborating and using uh, uh, access to free knowledge to be able to amplify the public debate about politics. And uh, the European Commission has also noted that this has really improved kind of the, the general participation in this debate and really added uh, to the results that they have received. Um, because in a lot of copyright debates, what you usually have is that uh, the users of the internet, the file sharers, are being blamed. Uh, the artists are being used as kind of uh, the reason for a lot of uh, demands. And uh, in but usually not by the people who are actually uh, the object of these discussions. So in the answers to the consultation, we have a great uh, uh, opportunity because the two groups that actually replied the most were users and artists. So exactly the ones that are always invoked in these discussions, but where we never hear what they actually think and what their actual problems are. So uh, what we found is that uh, on the one hand you have users that is uh, mostly regular internet users, but it also includes libraries, uh, public archives, universities and so on that have to deal with copyright. They are all pretty much across the board saying that European copyright needs to be reformed and it needs to be reformed uh, by law. Uh, on the other uh, end of the spectrum, you have rights holders uh, like publishers, public broadcasters, private broadcasters uh, and collecting societies that are all saying that everything is fine with the current system and they don't want a legal reform. And uh, interestingly, the artists are actually caught in the middle. They do see some areas where they have problems with the current copyright law. Sometimes they agree with the users, sometimes they agree with the rights holders. and. Um, if the Commission actually wants to go and do a reform, it's quite clear in which direction this reform would have to go because one side of the debate, the rights holders, actually doesn't want to change pretty much anything at all. So it's quite encouraging to see that the new Commission actually does want reform. Uh, I was uh, quite surprised to see when uh, the new Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker was running uh, for a commission president. He had a five-point plan in his election campaign, and it was actually in point one 
that he mentioned copyright reform. Um, if you look at this quote uh, from when he appeared in front of the European Parliament a couple of years ago, this kind of statement would have been revolutionary, that uh, a conservative politician comes out and admits that under certain circumstances copyright can actually be harmful. Um, and now, if you look at the Commission work program for next year, uh, they have said that they are going to come out with a new proposal in 2015. So we're expecting to see something quite soon. Um, what Juncker also did is he moved the responsibility for copyright from the economic department of the Commission to the digital department. So this can also give you a bit of an idea of which direction this uh, reform is supposed to take. Uh, of course, uh, we were all quite curious to see who in the Commission would be responsible for this. So uh, when Jean-Claude Juncker revealed his new cabinet, we were really uh, uh, kind of, well, scared or disappointed. We saw that the vice president um, responsible for digital affairs was uh, Andrus Ansip, the former prime minister of Estonia. Honestly, I didn't know much about him at the time. Uh, except that uh, he was a huge supporter of ACTA back in 2012 and had called the people who were protesting it tinfoil hats. Uh, but we were really surprised that when he actually came to the European Parliament for his hearing, uh, he said stuff like this, uh, I'm against geo-blocking, it just isn't fair. Uh, he also said that all the uh, software funded by the European Union should be open source. He also said that people should have access to any cultural content that they paid for, either directly or through taxes. So really uh, quite some revolutionary statements there. And <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was sitting there with one of my colleagues and uh, when he was kind of giving a short history of uh, uh, 1G to 5G rollout in the European Union, he turned to me and said he's actually kind of a nerd. Uh, and it was uh, kind of, yeah, like in, in his uh, statement to the parliament where uh, he was asked whether he's qualified to the, for the job, he kind of listed, yeah, I'm not really a programmer or anything, but I've learned these languages in school. And so kind of, uh, he, he seems to be at least aware of, of what this topic is about. Um, so at the same time, um, the European Parliament has now started looking at the old copyright directive and they have actually put me in charge of writing their report about what is wrong with current copyright laws. So uh, that means I'm the rapporteur for the review of the copyright directive from 2001. Uh, I will be publishing my draft report in a few weeks and then it will be my job to negotiate uh, with the shadow rapporteurs of the other groups in the European Parliament to hopefully come to a consensus text that when, will then be adopted later this year and will uh, go into the new proposal uh, for a European copyright reform. And I think we really have a unique opportunity here uh, to shift the focus from uh, a copyright that has ever been expanding its scope and ever having uh, more zealous enforcement of copyright rules to uh, actually getting the European Union to, to enforce and to put into law minimum rights of users, minimum rights of the public about what we should have a right to do with cultural works. And um, so I think for the first time we really have the chance to turn things around and not just stop kind of bad laws from being adopted, but actually change things for the better. Um, so how could something like this uh, look like? Well, uh, one way of achieving this shift is actually to replace the 28 national copyright system with a European copyright title. Uh, this may sound pretty crazy uh, or, or a bit scary at first, but um, I think we all have a lot of experience with how difficult it is to reform a very complex already existing system and uh, to apply patches to it when really the fundamental problems with it uh, lie in its structure. So if we actually went this direction and go for a European copyright, we have the chance to start with a blank slate and at least I think we would not end up with the very uh, crazy um, parts of the current copyright law that say, for example, that, uh, yeah, you can look at an ebook from a public library, but you actually have to go to the library and go to a special reading terminal, and only as many people can look at the ebook as there are physical copies in the 
library and so on. So I think if you actually start from scratch and write something new, it would probably be a lot more adapted to the internet and uh, to the digital world we live in right now. And also what they cannot do with the European copyright is kind of harmonize the rights of the right holders, but leave the uh, rights of the public completely optional. So either you have a right to parody or to freedom of panorama or you don't, but it would be more uh, uh, well, it would be easier to exchange culture across borders. So um, definitely a European copyright could put an end to geo-blocking based on European IP addresses. So uh, no more, this video is not available in your country if you travel from Germany to Austria. And uh, we can actually enshrine into law a user's right to access culture across national borders. Uh, we have the chance to stop the ever uh, infinite increase in the length of copyright terms and for the first time in history actually turn things around and reduce them. Uh, we can put an end uh, to, to digital uh, restrictions on works that uh, we have actually bought legally. Um, <laughs> Uh, under the current uh, copyright directive of the European Union, uh, it is illegal to circumvent digital protections, even if you actually have a right uh, through a copyright exception uh, to use this work. So, for example, a lot of European countries have a right to private copy, um, which is connected to an author's right to get some money for it. So a lot of European countries have something where, okay, you're allowed to make private copies, but you have to pay a levy on every hard disk you buy. But actually, we have a crazy situation right now where everybody is forced to pay these levies. But if you actually want to make a private copy and there is a technological protection measure on this work, you are breaking the law if you're actually circumventing this. So this is something that really needs to change and uh, I think it's not too much to ask that if you have a copyright exception, it's a user's right to actually exercise this exception and you cannot use technical protections to keep people from doing that. I think uh, we can use this copyright reform to include some sort of a flexible norm like uh, the fair use clause in the United States to make uh, the European copyright more flexible to react to technological changes. Uh, this is especially important because European legislation is really slow. Uh, the 2001 directive that we are working with now was uh, passed at a time when there was no YouTube, no Facebook, and it actually talks in its text about CD-ROMs, so you can see how these uh, kinds of things can really get outdated quite quickly. So um, we can use this reform to achieve uh, a shift from a read-only culture that looks at uh, the internet as a distribution medium of uh, authors that are professional creators to a read-and-write culture where every participant in the internet is both a creator and a consumer at the same time and um, create copyright laws that uh, no longer try to protect existing business models but actually foster new creation including uh, the right to remix. So I think now is really our best chance to make these changes because the European Commission has committed to putting something out next year. But uh, there is just uh, one little problem. Um, I, in, in the European Parliament, cannot actually uh, write such a draft law. Uh, the proposal for the new European copyright law will have to come out of the European Commission. And the commissioner who is most likely going to be drafting this text is the digital Günther Oettinger, uh, the digital commissioner Günther Oettinger, who is uh, uh, below the digital vice president, Andrus Ansip. And everything that Oettinger has said so far is uh, not exactly encouraging. Um, his favorite uh, public enemy is Google. So uh, in this article, uh, an interview in Der Spiegel where he's saying we can force Google. What he's talking about is we can force Google to pay for all kinds of things. So uh, in an interview, he said uh, that Google should pay for cultural content. And uh, this is something that has been tried recently in Germany and in Spain and has really backfired spectacularly. Um, 
In Germany, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, press publishers lobbied for the so-called ancillary copyright for press publishers, which means that aggregators like Google uh, would have to pay if they want to use parts of publicly available newspaper articles in a service like Google News, for example. Um, so Google's reaction to that, of course, was, uh, well, they looked at which publishers were actually asking for this fine. A lot of uh, publishers simply said uh, that Google can use their content for free because they're actually getting their visitors from Google News. And so it would be kind of a mutually beneficial situation. But uh, some large publishers like Axel Springer, for example, were insisting to have Google pay for this content. Uh, so Google simply started uh, delisting the pictures from the articles and snippets from them and only showed the headlines and um, well not surprisingly the the traffic to these publishers websites plummeted and very quickly they uh, gave Google a free license to use their content anyway because they realized that they were benefiting from this more than Google was um, so then they went to the German uh, uh, antitrust authority and said that Google was abusing its dominant market position uh, by <laughs> forcing them to give them a free license. And the German antitrust authority said, well, uh, it's not an antitrust problem that you cannot force a company to pay for something it doesn't want. Um, <laughs> In, in Spain, they tried to fix this problem uh, by introducing a similar law as the German one, but the only exception is that they made uh, this ancillary copyright an inalienable right, which means even if a publisher wants you to use their content for free, they are not allowed to allow this to you, so they have to charge a fine. Uh, so what Google did is that they shut down Google News in Spain, and uh, now the Spanish publishers are facing a decline in uh, visitors to their website and they are calling on the Spanish government to intervene to either force Google to, uh, well, <laughs> use Google News in Spain or to actually repeal this law. At the same time, German publishers are calling for the Spanish law to be implemented in Germany. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, Günther Oettinger, when he was speaking in front of German publishers, has promised that he would try to introduce something like this on a European level, because clearly Google won't shut down Google News in all of Europe, or maybe they will, we'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, this is kind of one of the ideas that uh, uh, Günther Oettinger has come up with so far, and I think that's uh, really quite disconcerting, because uh, the side effects of this are, of course, absolutely devastating, because a company like Google, if they really wanted to, they could, of course, afford to pay publishers, although I don't see why they would. But uh, if you're a small aggregator, if you're a competitor to Google, or simply uh, a blogger who is uh, doing reviews of uh, press articles or something like that, um, you are affected by this law and it's basically putting a price tag on embedded linking and uh, thereby really uh, uh, is a problem for free speech and uh, is endangering um, the, the very structure of the internet. Um, but yeah, so that makes it all the more evident that Oettinger is really in need of being fed some good ideas about copyright uh, by the people who are actually affected by it, uh, which is you. And uh, right now, I think uh, he is mostly being approached by large German publishing houses, and this is probably not the best advice to get. And uh, it is, of course, a difficult situation when we, are, uh, we have a copyright reform that is being reported about uh, by news publishers who at the same time have a commercial interest in this area. And that makes it all the more important to have alternative sources of information and to have a public debate uh, about this copyright reform taking place aside from the traditional newspapers and to uh, really put this de debate online. Um, so most of the voices uh, in the Brussels bubble, most of the lobbyists uh, do not want any change at all. And they are really uh, not on our side on this. Uh, so this is a letter uh, that some of my colleagues from the German Green Party and the German Social Democrats got in the parliament. Uh, which was complaining that they were considering um, making me the rapporteur for the copyright reform and saying it would be a slap in the face of any creator and it might uh, damage the trust in the German Social Democrats. Um, <laughs> 
So, but uh, to their credit, uh, the Social Democrats and the Greens were actually absolutely unfazed by this and uh, they were uh, almost offended that a lobbyist would actually go as far and kind of uh, give them advice of the internal workings of the parliament. So, yeah, maybe this is the first time the SPD gets credit at, at a CCC Congress, so... Uh, <laughs> But uh, the lobby group behind this letter, actually CC Composers Club, uh, they were known as CCC, uh, Commercial Composers Club, until 1999. And then they decided they needed a rebranding. Uh, now they are called CC. Uh, I don't think they have a lot of luck with names. Um, uh, French copyright lobby is also quite active, so I was a bit surprised when all of a sudden the French Minister of Culture and Communication did a speech in which she complained that I was the rapporteur for the uh, copyright reform out of the 751 members of the parliament, they picked the one pirate and... Uh, <laughs> That, uh, well, she didn't think that I would be able to kind of uh, lead uh, uh, a serious discussion about this important topic. And uh, it's kind of sad uh, if she thinks that, that so far she has not replied to my invitation to actually sit down with her and have a serious discussion about copyright. Um, but this is still kind of one of the more harmless uh, attacks that I'm getting from France. Uh, there was an article in the French Huffington Post uh, in which I was compared to a bank robber and a fraudster, and uh, I guess next thing they're going to call me a pirate. Um, <laughs> and, uh, well, this, this uh, French lobbyist who gets to write in the Huffington Post argues that um, there's a conspiracy between me and Günther Oettinger, and that... Uh, <laughs> He actually made me the rapporteur for copyright reform. Uh, of course, the commission has uh, absolutely no influence on who becomes rapporteur, but for them it's kind of enough evidence of a, a German conspiracy that, well, he's German, I'm German, we both want some sort of copyright reform, so clearly uh, we must follow a secret common agenda. Um, this is a breakdown of uh, the about 80 meeting requests I have gotten around copyright so far. Um, I have broken them down into different groups, so the publishers and CMOs, that's uh, collective management organizations, broadcasters, newspaper publishers, uh, producers or record labels and so on, uh, that really are the vast majority of, uh, of lobbyists that contact me in Brussels. Uh, there are also quite a few services providers, so uh, ISPs in some cases that are worried about liability, but also uh, um, providers of online uh, streaming services and so on. Um, I got relatively, uh, well, at least a few uh, requests from actual users or their representatives. So that's uh, library associations, some of the digital rights organizations. Uh, authorities is uh, kind of uh, the European Commission or uh, the copyright offices of particular member states. Uh, and very, very few authors actually represent themselves as lobbyists. Uh, they are almost al always represented by collecting societies uh, in lobbyism. So whenever uh, there is a difference of opinion between the authors and the collecting societies, it will be the voice of the collecting societies that is uh, transported uh, to um, the politicians. And I really think this is uh, a structural problem. Um, so this really shows that, uh, well, if we want kind of a balanced picture of what's going on with copyright, uh, the digital rights organizations that you're involved in or you personally, uh, really feel free to get in contact with uh, the various people in the commission and in the parliament who are working on these issues. It's really not that difficult to get a meeting. I think a lot of the challenges are more kind of uh, financial that, uh, well, uh, wealthy organizations have an easier time to employ somebody full-time to go to Brussels. But if you have a chance uh, to contact them or have some time to spend on that, it's really a large help. Um, about half of the meetings uh, I have actually said yes to. So these are the lobby meetings that I attended. I'm trying to really make an effort uh, to make this more balanced, to see about... well. Uh, 
relatively equal number of lobbyists from the different groups that are involved in this, and I'm also going to publish a detailed list of who this is exactly that I met with, and also everybody who made a request to meet me. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, I think uh, a lot of the other parliamentarians working with copyright will be confronted with more or less the same picture. I think they will get probably significantly less uh, uh, lobby meetings with users' representatives or digital rights organizations because a lot of them I talk to because they know me and uh, so we meet anyway, but I include this in my transparency report so that uh, it's not kind of a loophole. Um, so yeah, I think uh, for, for the people who are not actively trying to achieve this balance, they are going to get uh, a lot of more uh, voices from the rights holders. Um, so what this may lead to is kind of a typical Brussels compromise. Uh, the European Commission does want to reform copyright, but they are uh, afraid of the pressure that is coming, especially from the collective management organizations, from the publishers, and they will try to please them somehow. And uh, uh, what is, uh, well, the one danger of what is going to happen is that they are just going to apply a few patches here and there, but not address any of the real structural problems that we have. Um, so we really need to kind of get into this debate and also give the European Commission for once uh, some political support that they can actually justify making some uh, more radical changes. Um, so what does that mean in practice? Well, uh, one of the most important things is to bring this issue into the public debate and also discuss about uh, the copyright system that you would want to see. So if uh, you find this idea of a European copyright uh, convincing, there are some academics who put work into that, who uh, did uh, copyrightcode.eu, uh, which uh, is one example of what such a European copyright could look like. Uh, blog about that kind of stuff, make films about the problems with copyright, do theater about them, and uh, keep bugging your uh, politicians, your local politicians on this issue. Um, probably the biggest problem that we face is that simply taking to the streets like we did with ACTA is not going to do anything here. Um, it's comparatively easy to build a movement against something and to uh, stop a bad law from being uh, put into place. But uh, it is a lot more difficult to actually mobilize a community to build a movement in favor of something. And uh, I think it's possible, but we really need to not only complain, but to be willing uh, to actually find solutions and to compromise with the other political voices that are uh, in on this debate. And it will be my job in the parliament to find uh, a solution that is acceptable for everybody. But I really need you to be loud and to uh, voice uh, the ideas of internet users and uh, of the hacker community about what a European copyright should look like. Uh, so this is what's going to happen in the next couple of months. Um, in January, I'm going to uh, publish my draft report. So right now is the time to lobby me. I will be around here for the rest of the Congress. So feel, please feel free to approach me to come to my workshop and to give me some ideas about um, what my report should contain. So if you have uh, um, problems that you experience in your own country uh, that could be solved through European copyright uh, and that you haven't already submitted uh, to, the, to the consultation, please uh, tell me all about it. Uh, in, uh, then in the next couple of months, there will be discuss discussions in several committees in the European Parliament who are going to write an opinion on my report. Uh, all of these opinions will also have a rapporteur, probably from another party, well, definitely from another party. Uh, and so please approach them, tell them about your issues, and uh, you will be able to follow on my website exactly who these people are, what's going on uh, uh, in the debate in the Parliament. Um, so in uh, April, there's going to be uh, the vote uh, in the Legal Affairs Committee, the Yuri Committee, which is responsible for copyright. Uh, there, people from other parties are going to try to water down my report uh, by tabling amendments that will probably try to kind of change some of the parts of my reports into its opposite. So then it will be really important to contact people in the Legal Affairs Committee, tell them to vote down specific amendments or uh, to support some amendments perhaps. 
uh, so that we can achieve a report that is really kind of going in uh, the direction of a progressive copyright reform. Uh, the vote, the final vote on this report will then be in May. And sometime in the summer, sometime between April and fall, they haven't been very specific about it, um, the European Commission will uh, publish their proposal. Uh, there, I think the great challenge is going to be, there's probably going to be some stuff in there that you dislike. Uh, unless it's completely horrible, I would like uh, to ask you to kind of take a constructive approach to it, to really look at uh, what they come up with, uh, to discuss it, to... Uh, support it if it's going in the right direction and to formulate uh, possibilities of how it can be improved. Because uh, then once the Commission has tabled their proposal, it will be once again the Parliament and the Council uh, of the national governments that uh, will be able to change this uh, proposal for a European copyright law and that in the end will be the ones that will have to pass it. Um, to take kind of a bigger picture, uh, I think most of the politicians in the European Union know that we have a huge problem. Um, we have a rise of nationalism all across the EU and the EU is really in danger of losing uh, its legitimacy and they know that their future depends on the support of the people. So here we have kind of a unique uh, situation where a lot of the people are actually asking the EU to do something. They see a problem and they want it to be solved. Uh, usually where uh, the EU gets most of its support from is uh, what they call the four freedoms, uh, which is the freedom of movement, of capital, goods and services, uh, which is kind of uh, something that you uh, experience when you're traveling through Europe, that you don't have to uh, show your ID, uh, that you don't have to exchange currency and so on, and that is really kind of making people's lives easier. But obviously, if you look at these four freedoms, they are really kind of tilted in favor of economic freedoms. And what I want to propose is that uh, we should push for a fifth freedom, uh, so to say a freedom of movement for information. And... Um, if we call for the European Union to, to institute a right for people in Europe to access culture across national borders, I think the EU politicians will have a really, really difficult time to say no to that. Um, but, uh, well, if they don't want to look like complete hypocrites. So I think it is our task at this point uh, to make the EU more than uh, an economic union and really enhance the fundamental rights and freedom dimension of the European Union. But it's our responsibility to actually push for that and to make that happen. So... <laughs> so that's it from me for now. Uh, thanks a lot for listening, and yeah, I will be around uh, for questions here or later. Thank you so much for the great inspirational talk. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> now, we have, we have like 10 minutes left for questions and answers. Um, before we come to the questions and answers, you mentioned that you're going to give a workshop. Do yes. you want to uh, say that something is about that? Today at I think it's kind of uh, really talking about the draft report that I uh, am writing right now where I want to collect some input from you also strategic advice you know if you have particular things that really should be in this report uh, come to the workshop and, and uh, discuss it with me it's uh, from 5 to 6 in room B all right, five to six in room B today if you want to give some input to Julia. Now it's time for questions and answers. We have six microphones here in the room. If you have a question, please line up at the microphones. We start with a question from the internet. Hi. Um, does the freedom of panorama and compass, and compass taking photos of the Eiffel Tower? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so... Well, France does not have a freedom of panorama rule, but uh, the Eiffel Tower is pretty old, so the d design of the Eiffel Tower is in the public domain uh, because the architect uh, thankfully died long ago. Uh, <laughs> I really hope for a system where I don't have to say such things anymore. But however, no, you can't. Uh, well, you can use a picture of the Eiffel Tower that you take during the day. Uh, you can't take one that you take during the night because the light show that lights up uh, the Eiffel Tower is made by an artist who is still alive, I think, or at least not dead long enough. So, uh, yeah, the answer is uh, uh, depends. All right. 
Next question from microphone two. Uh, hello. Um, I'm kind of more pessimistic about the ongoing reform for basic two reasons. One reason is because we live in a world constrained by uh, Bern Convention and TRIPS Treaty. So basically we have to assume that the copyright is by default and we cannot put any restrictions like maybe registration and, and similar things which could improve our life. So uh, my, my first concern is that uh, synchronizing copyright across the EU will be basically uh, synchroni synchronizing uh, exceptions down. So, so what you spoke, it will be all some, down to some common level, of maybe five exceptions out of 20. Mm. Uh, that's my first concern. And the second concern is because many MEPs I spoke to are very fixated about the idea of, digi of single digital market and as an agenda for growth. And basically what is usually attached to it, and I think this is much more important priority, growth for the EU than and the freedoms we talk about. So they will be um, promoting exclusive rights, not only copyright, as a, as a new way forward uh, for, uh, for Europe and, and you know, employing unemployed people and young people and all this stuff. So my concern is how we counter this agenda. And I'm afraid that, that, may, that fifth freedom idea is good, but might not be strong enough to counter the growth Again, again, thank you. Mm. Uh, I think there are absolutely valid concerns. I've kind of limited myself to actually not that radical proposals, kind of making the, the copyright exceptions mandatory or reducing the copyright terms from 70 years after death back to 50 years after death is kind of the maximum that we can do in the international treaties that we have already signed up to. But I think we should still absolutely do it. Uh, some issues will be a bit more complicated, like for example, uh, some international treaties uh, uh, already in place, but also the upcoming uh, CETA treaties say that there has to be uh, some way of restricting people's ability to circumvent uh, uh, digital rights management. But I think we can still address this because even though um, uh, we may not be able to completely get rid of DRM, I think what we can do with this reform is to make it legal to, uh, to circumvent DRM if you are using a copyright exception. So I don't think this would violate international treaties, but of course if you have a, a copyright exception for uh, private copying, that's pretty much uh, anything. So uh, I think it would really solve, uh, well, 80% of the problem, I guess. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I mean, with, with uh, the idea of a European copyright, of course, this is only viable if uh, the proposal that comes out of the Commission is actually any good. I'm not saying uh, support it no matter what. Uh, we don't know if it's actually going to, uh, to be that, uh, uh, to, to really propose uh, this level of harmonization. Maybe they will go for something a lot more careful. Uh, but really to look at it and to kind of uh, build, uh, make up your mind when you see it, whether it's worth uh, fighting for, for improving this or whether we should just try to, to vote it down. Uh, I think we're not going to get the chance to reform this, uh, this copyright system for another 10, 15 years if we don't do it now. So I really want to take this chance and to take whatever comes out of the Commission and try to turn it into something good. Um, the digital single market uh, thing, I think uh, our, it's not uh, completely uh, coincidence that um, companies like Netflix are uh, coming from the US and rolling out uh, their service one European country at a time, because I think a European startup simply wouldn't have the capacity to run at a loss for several years and to clear copyright in 28 different systems. It, ta it creates a lot of overhead and this can only be done by a company that already has a functioning uh, market back in the United States. So I think there is also an economic argument for, for going in the direction of allowing uh, certain ways of dealing uh, with copyright. Uh, there are, I think the, the academia are really on our side on this. Uh, they, they show that people do not spend less on culture because they have access to the internet. They show that the people who do the most file sharing are actually the people who spend the most also on uh, uh, paying for cultural works. And... Um, <laughs> 
So uh, I, I think, uh, of course, uh, simply having the facts on your side is not necessarily going to help you to win the political battle. Um, I, yeah, I think the, the fifth freedom is, uh, I think, maybe one of the ideas that we can use, particularly in this time where there is a lot of criticism of the European institutions and they really have to give us something because they know that if they come out with a bad proposal, they're going to have another actor on their hands and nobody in the European Commission wants that. So I think we've already laid the groundwork work uh, to, to turn this into something good. All right, thanks. Um, we'll take the very last question from the internet and I hope for your understanding since everybody else has the chance to catch you there later and ask her and the people who follow in the stream don't. So sorry if you didn't have the time now to ask your question. Last question from the internet. Um, what do you think, how long does it take to bring an EU-wide copyright? <laughs> um, well, to pass it into law, well, it, it would be proposed... Uh, if we're very optimistic next uh, year in 2015, it would take maybe three or four years to be adopted, another two years of transition period. Uh, um, and uh, I think you would actually kind of, uh, depending on the level of harmonization, is it a European copyright title that only uh, encompasses kind of the, the commercial copyright, but or would it also encompass uh, the author's rights? Um, th that would depend uh, on, on how long it would take. But I think the fundamental thing is uh, you can't really shorten copyright terms on works that already exist. You can't really take away rights from authors that, uh, um, they, that they already have by the European Union. This is kind of, uh, uh, would probably be a fundamental rights issue that would have to be dealt with also on a national level. So for a European copyright to actually kind of take effect in the way that everything uh, is run under the new European copyright system, well, uh, take the lifespan of the people who are alive now plus uh, 70 years and then you're probably done, I guess. All right, thank you so much for the talk again and thank you for taking questions. Um, remember to come back at five for the workshop and room B, five to six. Thank you so much, Julia.